In this video, I'm going to provide an overview of diverticular disease with an emphasis on prevention and treatment through diet and lifestyle. The first section of this video is going to deal with terminology. I consulted several resources when putting this together, and it seemed like each one had some slight differences. So, forgive me if you've learned differently, but this is where I've landed. A diverticulum is a sac-like protrusion in the gastrointestinal tract. It can technically appear anywhere along the tract, but the most common location is in the large intestine. The plural form of diverticulum is diverticula. Thus, when we're talking about just one, it's diverticulum, and when we're talking about more than one, it's diverticula. The presence of diverticula falls under the umbrella term of diverticular disease. Then under diverticular disease, there are four manifestations of it. First, we have diverticulosis, which is the name given for the sheer presence of diverticula. This is considered to be an asymptomatic condition, and it's typically discovered incidentally during a routine colonoscopy. Because it's asymptomatic, the true prevalence of it is unknown. However, according to large pools of data from endoscopic procedures, the prevalence increases with age. Next up, we have acute uncomplicated diverticulitis. This is when there's acute inflammation that's limited to a diverticulum and the surrounding tissue. It's sometimes, but not always, accompanied by an infection, and patients typically present with the acute onset of abdominal pain and signs like fever and leukocytosis. Third, we have acute complicated diverticulitis. The signs and symptoms of this one align with those of acute uncomplicated diverticulitis, but it's distinguished by the presence of an abscess, perforation, obstruction, or fistula, and is therefore considered to be much more of a threat. Complicated diverticulitis sometimes results in the need for surgery, and in its most severe form, it can be fatal. Last but not least, we have diverticular hemorrhage. This is when an artery in a diverticulum ruptures. It's been cited in the New England Journal of Medicine as the leading cause of lower gastrointestinal bleeding in the United States, and it can be symptomatic or asymptomatic. The available literature on the progression of the disease suggests that only 1-4% of people with diverticulosis will experience complications over a span of 7 years. Then out of all of the cases of acute diverticulitis, between 10-14% of them are complicated. Now that we've covered some of the basic terminology, we're going to look at the etiologies. In other words, we'll explore the questions of why do diverticula develop and what causes the progression from diverticulosis to acute diverticulitis or diverticular hemorrhage. For many years, it was accepted that diverticula formed as the result of a low-fiber diet. This is often credited to the work of researchers named Neil Painter and Dennis Burkett. In a landmark publication from 1971, they stated, Diverticulosis appears to be a deficiency disease caused by the refining of carbohydrates, which entails the removal of vegetable fiber from the diet. Their justification was that the prevalence of diverticula in developed countries like the United States had increased with advances in food processing and subsequent changes to the food supply. Meanwhile, in places like Africa and other developing nations in Asia, the diet remained high in fiber and the prevalence of diverticula remained low. The suggested mechanism was that a high fiber diet allows the stool to pass through the large intestine more swiftly and reduces the need to strain to defecate. Conversely, a low fiber diet slows the passage of stool, hardens it, and increases the need to strain to defecate. 
The high pressure environment from straining increases pressure on the lining of the large intestine and compromises the integrity of it. Today, this concept hasn't been entirely discounted. However, the development of diverticulosis is now believed to be the result of multiple factors, not just a low-fiber diet. This is in part because of two cross-sectional studies that did not show an association between fiber intake, constipation, and diverticulosis. But it's also because of the discovery of additional risk factors. We previously saw the relationship between age and the prevalence of diverticulosis, with an increase in age resulting in an increased risk. Thus, the development of diverticula may be partly explained by an age-related decline in connective tissue. Another factor that's been suggested is sex hormones, with estrogen offering protection against diverticulosis. This is because premenopausal females have been shown to have a lower risk than similar aged males, but then there's no apparent difference in risk after the age of 50. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, there appears to be a genetic basis for diverticulosis. This is supported by population-based studies of siblings and twins, the observation of early-onset diverticulosis and connective tissue disorders like Marfan syndrome and Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, and differences in the location of diverticula, with it being mostly in the left side of the large intestine in North America, and mostly in the right side in Africa and Asia. All of this is to say that the low fiber hypothesis makes it seem like the development of diverticulosis would be 100% preventable. But in reality, some of the factors associated with it are beyond our control. Exactly what causes the progression from diverticulosis to diverticulitis and diverticular hemorrhage is not completely understood. However, diet and lifestyle do appear to play a significant role. Observational studies have shown that diet and lifestyle factors like a low fiber intake, high red meat intake, sedentary lifestyle, obesity, and smoking all increase the risk of complications. This sparks curiosity about the impact of chronic inflammation and gut dysbiosis. For instance, chronic inflammation is known to contribute to the development of cardiovascular disease, and acute diverticulitis and cardiovascular disease share several risk factors. Other risk factors for complications that are unrelated to diet and lifestyle include chronic use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and chronic use of corticosteroids. At this stage, if you're enjoying the video, I'm going to ask that you hit the like button and make sure you're subscribed to the channel. Both of these actions help me to reach and help more people. So far, we've seen a breakdown of the terminology for diverticular disease, and we've explored some of the possible etiologies of it. Next, we're going to talk about diet and lifestyle recommendations for prevention. For prevention, I feel there's enough evidence to support a recommendation to achieve adequate fiber intake. A 2020 meta-analysis of five prospective cohort studies revealed a dose-response relationship between total fiber intake and risk of diverticular disease. Compared to an intake of 7.5 grams per day, an intake of 30 grams per day reduced risk by 41%, while an intake of 40 grams per day reduced risk by 58%. Because there's insufficient data for beyond 40 grams per day, we cannot say that going above this amount offers additional protection. One of the studies in the meta-analysis also explored the impact of a vegetarian or vegan diet. The authors found that those diets were especially useful in preventing hospitalization or death from diverticular disease. Nevertheless, a diet that included meat but also contained greater than 25 grams of fiber per day offered protection against these outcomes as well. 
Taken together, it appears that a diet designed for the prevention of all forms of diverticular disease can include foods from both plant and animal sources, as long as there's an emphasis on fiber-rich, plant-based foods like fruit, vegetables, whole grains, and legumes. A diet pattern with clear and concise parameters that could be recommended to a patient for this purpose is the DASH diet. There's also no reason to believe that using supplemental fiber would offer an advantage over food sources. As such, the use of a food-first approach is encouraged. Other recommendations for prevention can be extrapolated from the risk factors identified for the progression to complications. Patients should avoid smoking, achieve or maintain a body weight that's healthful for them, and engage in an appropriate amount of physical activity. Recommendations for physical activity can be found in the Physical Activity Guidelines for Americans, which state that adults should perform at least 150 minutes of moderate-intensity aerobic activity and two sessions of muscle-strengthening activity per week. As a recap, for the prevention of diverticular disease, you just want to build a general healthful diet and lifestyle. Beyond that, there doesn't appear to be any unique recommendations that can be made. This applies to both preventing a first case of acute diverticulitis or hemorrhage, as well as reducing the risk of them happening again. Treatment for diverticular disease may look a little different because it's partly dependent on the type and the severity of the case. Patients generally don't receive treatment for diverticulosis and effort is instead put toward preventing complications as outlined in the previous section. Patients with acute uncomplicated diverticulitis have traditionally been given a nutrition recommendation of NPO or clear liquids for 2-4 to four days until symptoms improve. Then they're advanced to a low-fiber diet until symptoms subside, at which point they can begin reintroducing the fiber until they reach a prevention level with a general, healthful diet. This progression is meant to temporarily reduce the amount of stool passing through the large intestine while the inflammation is present. In theory, a low-fiber approach would minimize the risk of irritating the site of inflammation and avoid contributing to an obstruction or perforation. A careful search for literature on this topic revealed that this practice is based more on tradition than it is actual evidence. I was only able to locate a single systematic review on the topic that was published in 2018. The authors found a lack of high-quality interventional research examining the dietary management of adults with acute, uncomplicated diverticulitis. However, with the research they did locate, they found that the available evidence suggests liberalized diets for inpatient treatment are safe in uncomplicated cases. Therefore, they provided a recommendation that patients receive a liberalized diet consisting of any solid food versus bowel rest or a liquid diet, which essentially means you let the patient eat whatever they want to from the beginning. The author stated that this practice has a low risk of harm and likely has benefits to patients, like improved intake of essential nutrients and enhanced patient satisfaction. To be honest, I'm not really sure where to end up on this matter in terms of recommendations for practice. If you have a patient who's well-nourished, playing it safe with 2-4 to four days of bowel rest, clear liquids, or a low-fiber diet might be worth it. But for a patient with poor nutritional status, perhaps being a bit more aggressive with feeding is appropriate, since two to four days can lead to further deterioration. Somewhat surprisingly, I find that most patients prefer a conservative approach to reintroducing food, especially after all of the pain and discomfort they went through leading up to their admission. In the end, it appears that letting the patient dictate what they eat with uncomplicated diverticulitis may not have a significant impact on outcomes, but more research needs to be done in this area. 
When it comes to acute complicated diverticulitis and diverticular hemorrhage, the cases can have a wide range of severity. In less severe cases, the patient can avoid surgery and the nutrition therapy can look like what we just covered for acute uncomplicated diverticulitis. In more severe cases, like when there's a large abscess, complete obstruction, or frank perforation, they often have a prolonged inability to eat. These are the cases that usually result in the need for surgical management. Sometimes, patients with a severe case end up needing parenteral nutrition until it's safe for them to eat again. This is where it's important to be aware of how long they've been with inadequate intake and or how long the inadequate intake is projected to last. Another possible outcome from the surgical management of diverticulitis is the creation of an ileostomy or colostomy. Each of these have a set of unique nutritional recommendations to minimize risk of complications like dehydration, excessive gas production, or a blockage. So that covers terminology, etiologies, prevention, and the treatment of diverticular disease. The last topic I wanted to touch upon is nuts, seeds, corn, and popcorn. Since these foods are small and partly indigestible, it was once believed that they could become trapped in a diverticulum and contribute to acute diverticulitis or diverticular hemorrhage. As a result, it was common for doctors and dietitians to tell their patients to eliminate these foods from their diet. This was eventually examined in a prospective cohort that followed nearly 50,000 men for 18 years. The authors found that intake of these foods was not associated with an increased risk of diverticulitis or diverticular hemorrhage. In fact, they found the opposite. Men who ate more servings of these foods per week actually had a decreased risk. Despite there being a consensus in the literature that nuts, seeds, corn, and popcorn don't need to be avoided with diverticular disease, some doctors and many patients still hold this belief. So, as you encounter diverticular disease in your practice, you'll find yourself in situations where you need to convince others that they can continue to eat them. Here's a summary for nutrition and lifestyle recommendations. 1. The best way to prevent diverticular disease, including progression to acute diverticulitis, appears to be a general healthful diet with adequate dietary fiber, high physical activity level, and no smoking. This applies to both preventing a first case of acute diverticulitis or hemorrhage, as well as preventing them from happening again. 2. With acute uncomplicated diverticulitis, mild cases of acute complicated diverticulitis, and mild diverticular hemorrhage, providers may recommend bowel rest or a liquid diet for two to four days, followed by advancement to a low fiber diet until symptoms subside. However, there's limited evidence to support this recommendation, and there may be no additional risk in allowing a patient to have a diet with no restrictions from the beginning. 3. With acute cases of acute complicated diverticulitis and diverticular hemorrhage, especially when there's a need for surgery, diet advancement may be disrupted. Surgeries increase the possibility that a patient will need parenteral nutrition or guidance with a new ileostomy or colostomy. 4. There's no evidence to support a restriction on nuts, seeds, corn, and popcorn for patients with diverticular disease. If you want a screenshot of this, take it now. Thank you for watching. You can learn more about gastrointestinal diseases by clicking the images on your screen.